welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen, to the uh, June Lunch and Learn for the Harmon Museum and the Warren County Historical Society. I'm John Zimkus, your, your host and your speaker today. I am the Historian and Education Director here at the Harmon Museum. This is going to be one of the more fascinating stories I've come across, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I get to share it with you because uh, it is one I am, I am thrilled to talk about. The title, as you may recall, is one of the world's greatest athletes buried in Lebanon. The answer could be yes. The story of Richard Perry Williams. In Section C, lot number 153 of the Lebanon Cemetery, there's an interesting marker. It has the name Williams on it. There's an open book on top. On the left, it says, Helen, born 1883-1972. And on the right, it says Richard Perry, 1874-1966. The book most likely represents the book of life mentioned in Revelations 2015 in the Bible, recording the names of those who have lived uh, with God forever in heaven. This is Mr. Williams, R.P. Williams, Richard Perry Williams, Doc Williams, if you will. Uh, he may have well been deserved to be included in that the names of the righteous were where they are written. But there is also a type of secular book, a record book, if you will, um, where some people feel his name also needs to be included. That would be the record listing the names of the greatest sports athletes in history. This is Jim Thorpe. In 1940, Jim For Thorpe referred to Williams as the greatest athlete, the fastest sprinter who ever lived. Jim Thorpe, the man who some people consider the greatest 20th century athlete. Uh, the people of Lebanon in 1915 considered him one of the greatest athletes in the, uh, in the, in the world today, at that time. In the 1970 book, Sport Athletes, uh, David P. Willoughby lists the following feats for Williams. These all occurred between 1898 and 1910. 100 meter dash, nine, uh, nine seconds and four fifth seconds. 400 meter dash, 46 and three fifths seconds. Mile run, four minutes, 25 seconds. A running broad jump, 26 feet, one half inch. Standing broad jump with weights. Now some of these are kind of obscure by today's standards. Standing broad jump with weights, 15 feet 4 inches. Standing jump backwards with weights, 13 feet 3 inches. Sergeant jump, which is a vertical jump, 34.9 inches. Running high kick, 10 feet 3 inches. Hitch and kick, which is standing uh, jump off one foot and a kick, nine feet six inches. Shot put with a 16 pound shot, 47 feet nine inches. Shot put with a 12 pound shot, 54, 57 feet three inches. Discus throw, 142 feet nine inches. Baseball throw, 415 feet three inches. Circling the bases and on a baseball field, 12 seconds, chinning of the bar 48 times, dipping parallel bars 55 times, high jump on ice skates uh, 4 feet 6 inches. Now the, the most amazing record he may have had took place on June 2nd, 1906 in Winthrop, Massachusetts when he was said to have run the 100 yard dash in 9 seconds flat. This is Frank G. Menke. Uh, he was a sports writer and historian. He worked for the Hearst newspapers from 1912 to 1932. He was billed as, quote, America's foremost sports writer. Uh, his book, All Sport Record Book, it was an authoritative uh, sports reference book at that time. 
In his 1931 edition, he writes, R.P. Williams was asked to run in the exhibition 100-yard dash, quote, on a truly measured track against absolutely perfect watches. He agreed and made his world record on June 2nd, 1906. Five businessmen who were sprinting enthusiasts and expert times uh, each timed him and each watch showed nine seconds for a full 100 yard dash. A while later, Williams regained his breath and tried to shatter that mark, but the best he could do was uh, nine uh, seconds and one fifth seconds, so 9.2. Uh, the fourth best time in his brilliant career. Um, Willoughby, back in his books, uh, disputes some of the records, but he suggests that that nine second mile, that nine second uh, 100 yard dash rather, could possibly be accurate. The world record on the 100 yard dash was set in 1962 by my name, Frank Budd, uh, 9.2 seconds. In 1974, uh, Ivory Crockett and, and, Houston, and a man named Houston McTeer in 1975 both clocked nine second 100 yard dashes uh, on unofficial timepieces. Uh, they don't keep much records for 100 yard dashes anymore because of, they're mostly in the metric system. Unsain uh, Bowl, when he ran his uh, 100 meters, in 9.58 seconds would have been nine seconds for a 100 yard dash. The 100 yard dash compared to meters is 91.44 meters. So there's 28 extra feet if you're running the 100 meter dash. The great Jim Thorpe in his article entitled What the Human Limits Are uh, said Williams in his prime could have defeated without trouble any sprinter who ever lived, he could have left Paddock, Wyckoff, Simpson, Tolan, Medcalf, Owens, all of them yards behind. The Owens, of course, he's referring to is Jesse Owens. So why are Williams' records, especially those in track and field, ignored? Well, the main reason uh, is that uh, R.P. Williams was considered, quote, a professional pedestrian. Uh, in the book, The Rise and Fall of American Smart, uh, Sports, Mudville's Revenge, Ted Vincent writes, in the history of track and field sports in the United States, the first activities to take any kind of organized form were under the name pedestrianism. After the Civil War, runners would perform, uh, they would be paid or win prize money, uh, these, th that's why they were called professionals. Um, the most remarkable of all these professional pedestrians, he writes, was Robert Perry Williams. These races took place in amusement park uh, tracks or decidedly a working class sport. In 1888, the um, Amateur Athletic Association, the AAU, was formed. None of Williams' records were recorded by the AAU because he was a professional. Uh, Edward Sears, in his 2001 book, Running Through the Ages, said, unfortunately, none of Williams' claim records were reported to the newspapers and reporting sporting events of the day. Charlie Paddock is one of the guys that Thorpe said he could beat. He was a two-time Olympic champion the first person ever to be called the fastest man alive. He wasn't too sure about Williams. Um, he wrote in his book in 1933, uh, Track and Field, R.P. Williams claims a number of astonishing splint records, but his competitive records does not compare well against the times with which he was accredited. I mention this merely because sport authorities of today, judging solely from Williams' marks, place him among the great sprinters of history. His professional contemporaries did not rank him so. Was he simply a braggart who um, bluffed his way, um, saying he won all these records? But how could he claim to have so many records 
in so many different sporting events, in so many different locations, after in so many different years. Uh, Ted Vincent pointed out in uh, his book, the stereotype of the professional peds, as he refers to them, um, are poorly, a poorly educated and easily bribed showman didn't fit Williams. Richard Perry Williams was born on April 21st of 1874 in Cornwall, England, where President Biden and the G7 met just last week. He came to America in 1880 when he was five years old, graduated from the prestigious Dean Academy in Franklin, Massachusetts, studied at Harvard and the University of Pennsylvania. Two years of his college work was said to be studying medicine. A one source states at Harvard, he got sidetracked by athletics and wound up with a bachelor's degree in physical education. Not necessarily a big man. In 1900, he was five foot nine. Uh, the average height was five seven, so he's a little bit taller than them. And he weighed 141 pounds. This gentleman is Eugene Sandow. Famous Bolivian strongman, father of modern bodybuilding. Uh, in 1902, Williams is said to have visited him to find out how he could be stronger. What could he do to increase? Uh, Williams learned that he uh, to, to learn how to make himself stronger through several years of systematic weight training. He added 20 pounds of mostly muscle and was able to improve most of his records, especially those requiring strength. In 1899, Williams was coaching at Tufts University in Massachusetts. Uh, by Christmas in uh, 1901, Williams married Helen J. Barclay at the Orion Heights Methodist Episcopal Church in uh, East Boston, Massachusetts. There began a 30 plus year journey traveling across the United States with Doc Williams, as he was called, coaching thousands of adults and children to be physically fit and how to be successful on the playing field. After, uh, after Tufts, he went to New, New London, Connecticut, where he became the athletic director of the local YMCA. After that, he spent time at the Berkeley Private School in New York. It was while he was at Berkeley in New York that one of his first major public publicity bumps took place. He was featured in the Hassan, the Oriental Smoke, uh, America's favorite cigarette, uh, the only one with a cork tip, uh, series number two of cards. So this is the tobacco card, this is what it said on the back. It's, you know, predating bubblegum cards, with your baseball cards, but this was popular. We have in our Armstrong gallery, another one from a different tobacco company talking about Clifford Harmon, the brother of William Elmer Harmon, and how what, they had an aviator series. So he is in the sports series here. Um, he then left there and went to the uh, Haverhill High School uh, in Massachusetts, then the Greensboro, North Carolina High School, then to Paducah, Kentucky, where he was the athletic coach of Paducah High School and the city's playground instructor. So here he is, and I'm pretty confident, uh, that's probably the, a Paducah, Paducah, Kentucky uh, sweater. It could be Penn, but I think it's Paducah, and that is Mr. Uh, Williams at that time. In December of 1915, the Evening Sun newspaper in Paducah lamented that Doc Williams was leaving. Mr. Williams' departure, the city will lose a valuable all-around man. Few athletic directors in the country are as well-versed in the practicality of every sport as Mr. Williams, and few have such a splendid athletic record themselves. Mr. Williams came to Paducah with a reputation as being a physical director and coach second to none, and he certainly lived up to that. The place which lured him away was Lebanon, Ohio. Uh, in 1915, a petition signed by 300 people 
approximately 10% of the population was there. And all the family names you, were, uh, you would recognize in the old days, there were Bantas who signed this petition. There were Nixons, there were Croppers, there were Grays, there were Freds, there were Corwins, there were Blairs, there were Travillos, there were Kaufmans. It's a sort of who's who in Lebanon of a hundred years ago. The petition was addressed to the Civic Trust of Lebanon on the William Elmer Harmon Foundation. William Elmer Harmon was born here in Lebanon. He's the man our Harmon Hall is named after. Uh, this is the Harmon Hall as a year or two after it was built. It was dedicated in 1913 in November. And this was the facility that Mr. Williams would be running. Uh, the top of that petition said, we, the Understein residents of Lebanon and vicinity, realizing the true worth of R.P. Williams to Lebanon, Ohio, as a physical director, as a leader of boys, do heartily recommend his appointment as the physical director at Harmon Hall, Lebanon, Ohio. They arrived on December 29, 1915. He wasn't supposed to go to work until a week or, a week or so later, but they moved into their home. This is Mulberry Street. This is where the Oddfellows Temple is. This is Mechanic Street. This is the house they moved in, 129 Mulberry Street. Today, it's pretty much where the tree is for the Bicentennial Park. And there's the Oddfellows Temple right over there where uh, Bill Dooning has his law office. So that's where they first moved in. The first day he got there, he went to Harmon Hall and he volunteered to give the newly organized, quote, first regiment basketball team uh, a, quote, final workout before their first game. This is the this front page article, Professor R.P. Williams, he's coming, he's in Lebanon, and it talks about how he, you know, he's not totally unpacked yet, and he's working with the boys at, uh, the, at Harmon Hall. He was also put in charge of Har Harmon Park, 80 plus acres. Now, this is from the 1920s, this is Harmon Park and Harmon Golf Course. This 88 acres right over here. Uh, this is the creek. Uh, this is, would be uh, East Street uh, Bridge. Uh, the golf course is primarily over here. Uh, but this, this is the area he also was in charge of. He also would coach uh, Lebanon High School football, baseball, track, and basketball. And it was said that he received a, quote, handsome income in salary. In the next six months or so, uh, it was reported that things had really had done, he had done wonders. Uh, he had gained the respect of the young men and old men alike, and the large classes bear that assertion. Last winter, the businessman class, and I'm pretty confident this is a businessman class here, and there's uh, Williams right there, uh, had, had been set up, and the new class is even larger. Uh, Notice these shiny plaques right over here. Two of them are right there. Uh, these were all set up when Williams was here. Uh, we have the uh, indoor record for uh, putting 50 pound dumbbells in one hand. 1916, M.R. Johnston did it 17 times. 1918, Henry Williams, 22 times. And then the next year, Henry Williams had his Wheaties and spinach together uh, because he did it 33 times, 50 pounds, one hand. And I, I don't know if he walked crooked because this arm was so much bigger than this one. Uh, and then we have some indoor records of the running high jump, uh, five uh, feet one inch, five feet two inch, five feet four, five feet five, and five feet six. So there, these records were, were set here uh, in Harmon Hall next door. He also organized, and this uh, little article mentions that, that he had a walking club, and they walked a 12-mile hike to South Lebanon and back, and did it multiple times a year. 
Local historian Marion Snyder, who wrote through much of the uh, uh, 70s and 80s uh, in the local newspaper, said in the 1978 article that when he was 10 or 12 years old, Williams would come to his classroom at the old Pleasant Street School, where uh, the public school building was. It's now uh, Pleasant Square Park in front of the post office. And he would have the students do their exercises right next to their desk. A variety of exercise moving, moving our arms and legs and some body movement as well. Sunday, May 23rd of 1920, the Cleveland Plain Dealer had an article all about Harmon Hall and what Williams was doing. This is the gymnasium, and so this is where the Village Green is. Uh, you know, there's no shops there. This would probably be where the general store is. This two-lane bowling alley is where the farm tools are. Uh, that, that's why that whole room is so long and narrow. It was a two-lane bowling alley. Uh, the great pioneer uh, work that has been accomplished in Lebanon under the supervision of the Civic Trust and particularly under the direction of Professor R.P. Williams. Um, it is also around this time that a young sports artist working for the New York Globe had an idea, he was trying to come up with a new idea. Rather than draw a cartoon of just one sports figure, he would do about nine. And he included Williams in this nine. It was R.P. Williams made a running high kick of 10 feet 3 inches in New London, Connecticut in 1905. And so this would be Williams right here. Now, this artist, whose name was Leroy, uh, but he went by his middle name, uh, decided, he, he called this uh, Champs and Chumps. When he did another cartoon like this, he called it something different. And he used his last name. He called it Ripley's Believe It or Not. So in the very, very first, and he used his middle name, Robert, so Leroy Robert Ripley, under the name of Robert Ripley, created Ripley's Believe It or Not, and R.P. Williams was in the very first, although it wasn't called Believe It or Not, it was Champs and Chumps. R.P. Williams' uh, life turned quite tragic on Monday, July 5th of 1920. This is part of Harmon Park. This is the East Street Bridge. This is a dam. They had dammed the bridge, uh, the, the, the creek, and it was a swimming hole. People dived off of that. Uh, during that fourth mammoth 4th of July celebration, 17-year-old Henry Williams, R.P.'s oldest son, was enjoying a day and was diving from the huge dam in the swimming hole. He was an expert swimmer, they say. Uh, he showed great athletic prowess and was attending the same prestigious Dean Academy in Franklin, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, he took a running start and dove into the water. His head struck the back of a close friend named Harold Williams, no relation. Both boys went under. Harold quickly came up, but Henry did not. At first, people thought he was joking. And then they started to panic, and they, they began to search for him. They found him. They brought him up. R.P. Williams himself gave his son artificial respiration. Uh, Dr. Edward Blair, he and his brother, Dr. Bob Blair, did start Blair Brothers Hospital about three years later. But Dr. Ed Blair and his father, Dr. Benjamin Blair, both were summoned, but they could not revive him. Uh, the Western Star wrote, Henry was thought uh, either to have suffered a concussion of the brain or broke his neck and failed to come up to the surface. It referred to Henry as one of the finest, cleanest, manliest Christian boys of the community. His funeral was held on July 8th of 1920 in the Methodist Episcopal Church on Silver Street, and he was buried in the Lebanon Cemetery. And that is his marker in the Lebanon Cemetery. Later that month, on July 29th, 1920, Professor R.P. Williams, the director of Harmon Hall, 
tended in his resignation to the Civic Trust. He was going to um, Bessemer in Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Uh, the Western Star wrote that the salary of $1,000 is considerably more than he received here. $3,000 adjusted for inflation would be about uh, 41000 today. He had initially turned down going there, but then received a second offer and a two-year contract. And the newspaper did speculate that the loss of his son also had something to do with his decision. The newspaper went on to say he has met with great success in athletic contests and track meets while here. Being a great athlete himself, he has the happy faculty of knowing how to, to impact his expert knowledge on his pupils, as pupils, as the young men of Lebanon will attest. Not quite two years later, although the Western Star would often tell you how he's doing in the Upper Peninsula, he decided to move again. And this time he was moving to Chicago, and it was 1923. He was now working at the prestigious preparatory school called the Harvard School for Boys. And he was coaching the basketball team uh, during the 1923-24 season. Uh, and he became a minor figure in what was called the trial of the century. This is the famous Leopold and Loeb case. Clarence Darrow is defending these two boys rich geniuses, if you will. Both got their college degrees while they were still teenagers and were working on their master's degrees. They were bored. They were smarter than so many other people. They, they, they did minor crimes just to see if they can get away with it. And then they decided, let's kill somebody. And they decided to kill Bobby Franks, who was a cousin to one of the boys. R.P. Williams was the gym teacher who was giving Bobby Franks uh, a series of physical therapy lessons. He waited in vain in the boy's house to give him the next lesson, but Bobby never returned because the two had uh, killed him. They made it look like a kidnapping at first. The, bo the body was found some 25 miles outside of New York City. Dozens of people were questioned. Uh, they would be held for a while and then released. Williams recalled, I was unable to attend the boy's funeral because the police, I was at police headquarters going through further questioning. Uh, they, were, they did it to demonstrate their perceived intellectual superiority, which they thought rendered them capable of carrying out a perfect crime, absolutely uh, absolving them from responsibility of their actions. Uh, like I said, it was the first one called the trial of the century. Darrow represented them, but did not argue that they were innocent. He spent hours in front of the judge alone arguing against the death penalty. In 1956, Meyer Levin wrote a fictionalized version of this in a book called Compulsion. In 1959, it was made into a movie. They changed the names of the main characters. Orson Welles played the um, Clarence Darrow role, but his name was Jonathan Wilkes. The name of the two boys, uh, the murderers, still had an alliteration in their name. Nathan Leopold was now Judge Steiner, and Dickie Loeb was now Artie Strauss. Uh, Leopold was played by Dean Stockwell, and Bradford Dillman played uh, Artie Strauss. In the film, and I also assume in the novel, Strauss shows off his superiority, his arrogant superiority, at least to himself, by helping the police find the kidnappers. Uh, and the cops asked him, uh, some questions. And here, briefly in the movie, a Doc Williams character appears. The police cap lieutenant says, what about the teachers? Any oddballs? Artie says, well, 
Pop Wiggins. Now, he didn't say Doc Williams. He said Pop Wiggins. That's the gray-haired one, referring to him right there. I guess you wouldn't say he was exactly normal, slapping towels at kids in the gym and stuff like that. But then, that wouldn't mean anything, as he drops hints left and right. Uh, Williams left the Harvard School for Boys at the end of the semester. He once said he was disgusted with millionaire sons and he went to Wichita, Kansas. In Wichita, he worked for the Elks Club, and uh, toward the end of the 1920s, he helped uh, coach the Henry Clothier team, which was an AAU team and won a national championships. In 1930, he comes back to Ohio, and he's coaching at Wittenberg College uh, in Springfield, Ohio. He's the physical, direct, uh, physical instructor and successful coach. It is around this time that he is once again in, put in the national spotlight, not by Ripley's, believe it or not, but by Ripley's competition, John Hicks's Strange As It Seems. Now, not as well known today, but apparently at one time, books were made of what uh, strange as it seems. There were strange as it seems uh, museums, just like you find Ripley ones today. Uh, it referred to him as the greatest all-around athlete of all time and lists eight of his records, including the nine-second hundred-yard dash. Um, the, uh, the strip continued from 1928 to 1970. On March 31st of 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, president, created the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, a work relief program for young men designed to combat unemployment during the Great Depression. Company number 588C was formed on December 14th, 1933. The little letter C represent colored, and these gentlemen were at Fort Ancient and they helped build the, the shelter there and many of the other things they did there. Uh, Williams, that same year, who was now nearly 60 years old, was hired to train members of the CCC. Local historian Marion Schneider again said he, had, he trained them to handle the job of keeping the young men in the Camp Blimber and in good health conditions. While there, they moved back to Lebanon now living at uh, 218 North Cherry Street. That's the, this house right here. That's where the old school was. We saw a picture of that earlier. And that would be this house right here. And that is uh, Pleasant Square Park. And there's the old academy building right there. So very close to uh, where the park and the school was. He found himself in the news one more time he would predict, and these were front page articles, 1938 and 1939. He's predicting who Grantland Rice, who was one of the great sports writers back in those days, would pick for the All-American football team. And he would say, these are the ones he will pick. And he came very, very close. This is 1938. Doc Williams announces his All-American football team. William misses one. I mean, he, his record of who, who Grantland Lice is going to pick as the best football players, uh, pe people are looking at, oh, this is our guy. He knows that he can pick who's going to win it. In early 19, eight, 1940, while working for the CC camp, which was known as Camp Warren, two miles east of Lebanon, um, he's the one who announced that the, the camp was closing. Uh, it was in June of 1940, that the Rotary Magazine published this article, What is the Human Limit? Uh, Jim Thorpe has told to Irvin Wallace. Now, Irvin Wallace, the young 24-year-old writer he's talking to, eventually became a best-selling author, wrote uh, the Chapman Report in 1961 and the Prize in 1962, both of which came movies. Uh, and that, once again, um, uh, Thorpe is saying, I'm going to tell you the fastest sprinter who ever lived, a man 
may never have heard of because he was a professional running races for a living while the record books usually contain only amateurs. I'm referring to R.P. Williams. Two years later, Williams responds, and this is a letter to Rotary Magazine saying, I'm the one he's talking about, and by the way, here's some more of my records. So he's really not a humble guy when it comes to his records, but he does go on listing a dozen or so more. During World War II, he's working at the King's Mills Ordnance Plant at King's, uh, King's Mill. He's an inspector. Uh, in April of 1943, the company newsletter called The Primer, pretty good name for a, a, a gun smoke, uh, a um, powder, gunpowder factory, uh, has an article on the 69-year-old Williams, uh, lists dozens of his records, it points out that R.P. Williams, world record holder, is now a KMOP employee. Records rec records the consecutive victories in one wall handball from 1895 to 1943. So apparently he, he didn't lose a handball game all during that time. And they say 14,657. Uh, and then they mention the fact that Ripley, back in 1933, had him once again in Ripley's, believe it or not, back when it was a mere 14,168 victories. Um, after the war, next one, please. Um, Williams' daughter, Vera, who was the society editor of the Western Star, uh, moved with her husband to Miamisburg, and R.P. and his wife, Helen, joined them and went to... Uh, Miamisburg. He periodically showed up in uh, newspapers locally. This is a Dayton Daily article on the front page, 1953. Coach of victim recalls 1924 Leopold and Loeb Capes or Loeb and Leopold Hunt. And this is about three years later talking about is with some of his trophies there. He died on April 1st of 1966 in the home of his daughter in Miamisburg. He was 20 days short of being 92. Buried in the Lebanon Cemetery next to his son, 17-year-old Henry. Various obituaries mention he was once known as the fastest human. He held several world records. Was he the great athlete he claimed to be? Well, as you've heard, he wasn't shy about tooting his own horn. Uh, if the records are true, why shouldn't he be proud of his accomplishments? In 1978, the People's Almanac II, which I don't know if you collected these, the series of books from the 70s, but I still have them. Uh, fascinating stories. In a nearly 1,500 page book, the principal writers and editors were David Walensky and his father, Irving Wallace. The same, Walensky being the real family last name, Wallace being the famous author, now is, he and his son are coming up with this, and they have dozens of writers. In a chapter called The Incredible Footnote Athletes, it's all about R.P. Williams. It is possible that, to tell whether or not Williams' records are, it isn't possible, I should say. It is certainly would not be the first time that an athlete had been slighted because he was at odds with the powers that be for his sport. Nor could it be the only example of an athlete ahead of his time towering over his competition. On the other hand, if the marks are incorrect, it wouldn't be the only time that inaccurate and fraudulent marks were published and accepted by some people as the truth. It is undeniably fact that R.P. Williams knew his business. He knew how to be physically fit. He knew how to convey that knowledge to thousands of men, women, boys, and girls he instructed for almost 50 years. They believed him. They believed in him. 
It seems that every time Doc Williams left one town for a move to another, he was honored by the community he was leaving, not only as a coach and a trainer, but also, as one town put it, a valuable all-around man. R.P. Williams was viewed by the people with whom he came in contact as a real champion in every sense of the word. And that is something for the record books. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming. Uh, please visit uh, the gift shop, 10% off on anything you purchased today. Uh, your admission also allows you to go through the museum. There are some great things. Uh, go through the, uh, the Armstrong Gallery of Flight. Take, check out that Clifford, uh, Clifford Harmon tobacco card. Uh, <laughs> and many other things. And I hope to see you um, next week, or next month rather, for uh, Queen Victoria or Mrs. Satan. Hello, I'm Doug Baird coming to you from the Warren County Historical Society Museum here in downtown Lebanon, Ohio, right across the street from the Golden Lamb. This, over this past year, with everybody being uh, down and away from what they're normally doing this time of year, the museum have been busy. And we want to invite you to come down and see what all they've done here in the museum. Here in the Archaeology and the Paleontology Museum, they've got a really nice display for you to show. We have fossils of all various types. I'd like to take a moment to share the prehistoric history of this fossil. It's a stromatophoroid sponge, and what happened was an asteroid hit the Silurian Sea like 400 million years ago. It stirred everything up from the bottom and all the living organisms on the bottom were covered in silica and thus changed the, the rock itself into quartz. So this is the remains of a sponge from 365 million years before present. We have more Ordovician period fossils, your standard brachiopods and bryzoans and corals. And then we also have another fossil case here with probably five different species of trilobites. And then our state fossil, which is the Isotelus trilobite. And then we have a wide variety of crinoids. The bow and arrow didn't come along until late in prehistoric times. Here in front of me are the third ancient cultures, arrowheads, which are just triangular shaped points. Here we have a series of banner stones, archaic knives, and then we're getting into your paleo artifacts. Uh, here's a Clovis Paleo that goes back 14,000 years ago here in Ohio. And we have your Fort Ancient pottery case with lots of uh, knives displayed in it. Here in, in this case, we have Flint Ridge Chert, which is Ohio's official gemstone, which the Indians use quite a bit of. And it was highly prized within a thousand miles of this area. And then we have pipes, gorgets, pendants, more pipes. Okay, here on our wall is depictions of the different cultures that inhabited here in Ohio. You have your Paleo Indians that go back to almost 14,000 years ago. And then you have your Archaic peoples that were here about 8,500 years ago, and the Adena people, which were the first of the mound building cultures here in Ohio. And then we have a geologic 
timeline here that shows you that the artifacts collected in this area, actually the fossils, go back to 550 million years before present. And the timeline will show you the time of those different cultures in relation to what was going on in the world at that time. Like we have the time of the pyramids, when Jesus was born and Muhammad founds the Muslim faith. And then we'll take a few steps down. The next culture is the Hopewell culture who had vast setups of trade all over the country where they brought in obsidian, mica, garnets, copper, and exotic flints from in the West. The Woodland Tribes was a combination of the Adena and Hopewell people and was a time period that gardening and growing their food was coming to be more prevalent. And then the last prehistoric culture in this area was our Fort Ancient people, which Fort Ancient, as I mentioned, is the site that's just down the road here that they became gardeners to where their stature declined and they started having more diseases and so forth. Thus, they were last of the prehistoric people. Come down and visit us here and bring your children as I'm sure that they would enjoy taking a look around. And if they don't learn what they want to learn, ask somebody here in the museum and they'll be happy to put you in the right direction. Thank you.